Welcome everybody. My name is Mina Jane and I'm the director of the Ashland Public Library in Massachusetts. As you can see, we have people from all over the country and world here because our uh, our authors are from all over the place. Really interesting stories that we cannot wait to delve into. But before we get to them, I just want to say a couple of things. One is I'd like to thank the Friends of the Ashland Public Library who support all of our programming. And I would like to thank our authors who agreed to let us share this program with other libraries. And actually 25 other libraries signed on to this because um, librarians love debut authors. I mean, it's not a, <laughs> it's probably not a secret. So welcome to the patrons of all those libraries, as well as from Ashland and the fans of Lauren, Rita, and Nishida, who have come from all over the place. Um, you can buy signed books from all of our authors from Aesop's Fable, and I put a link for that in the chat. And um, I am going to leave the chat open while we have our discussion, but if you have a question for our authors, please put that in the Q&A, which is at the bottom of your um, Zoom screen, because that's a lot easier for me to um, keep a track of. So... Without further ado, I'm going to say welcome to Lauren, Rita, and Nishida for being here with us on this cold in, in Massachusetts January night. <laughs> um, I was so thrilled to reach out to you, and you all said yes right away to doing this talk about your, your journey into becoming a debut author. So I know nobody wants to hear from me, so I'm going to go right into tell us about yourself and your book. And I'm going to start with Rita because your book came out first, last May, June-ish, right? So tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, your book, which looks amazing about a Chinese pirate queen. Yeah, real person. Um, yeah, so hi, everyone. I'm uh, Rita Chang Epic. Uh, thanks for being here today. And uh, my book, um, Deep as the Sky, Red as the Sea, which you can kind of see in the far corner over there, um, is a historical novel with some light speculative elements uh, and based on the life of a real pirate queen who lived in China during the early 1800s. And uh, the book basically follows her her uh, start as a, you know, from being a peasant girl up to uh, becoming the, the commander of the largest pirate fleet in China. And actually, according to some historians, the largest pirate fleet ever in the world. So um, kind of kind of cool that she existed. And uh, yeah, this is a fictional retelling of her life. Awesome. I love it. So historical fiction based on a true story. Um, Lauren, what about you? Tell us about yourself and your book, which just looks amazing to me. Medusa oh, Sisters. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so I'm Lauren J. Bear. I wrote Medusa Sisters. It came out in August of 2023. And I'm a former middle school teacher. I taught humanities for a decade. Um, I'm a mom of three kids, all under the age of eight. So I'm in my son's room right now hiding from them so that I can have a nice conversation with you guys um and Medusa Sisters is um it's a really straightforward title it's about Medusa Sisters it is the you know the Gorgon myth retold um from the perspective of the two sisters who were cursed beside Medusa I love anything that has to do with um you know, the Olympians or the gods or, you know, all of that nutty stuff that happened with them. <laughs> I also love pirates. So I'm, this is a really good start for me. Um, Nishida, am I saying your name right? I want to make sure I do. Yes, that's so, absolutely right. So you, as a debut author, your book just came out on January 16th. So you might be on book tour and I've heard you've had some really good news about your book. So tell us more about you and this book. Yeah, so my book is called The Night of the Storm. It's a locked room novel. It's about this Indian family that's trapped during a hurricane uh, and it's set in Houston, Texas. And like you said, I had my debut just last week. It's been like a dream week. I was so excited to learn at the end of the week that the book actually came out on the USA Today bestseller list. So that's it's been wonderful. It, it has surpassed all my expectations, so really happy. That is amazing. It's so good to hear, um, especially as a debut author. I'm sure that it's nice to get the accolades um, as you do, or just having people come up to you and be like, wow, I loved your book, like me. <laughs> really, like, just loving this whole, um, you know, uh, diversity of our panel in the not just your own backgrounds but the the books that you've written so before we get into the books a little bit more though I really do want to dig into you and who you are and how you became you know came to be today so I'm going to um ask you to a couple of questions about that so I'm gonna start with Lauren um were you always a reader 
Yes, voracious reader. And I have to thank the, you know, the librarians in Long Beach Public Libraries, um, where I grew up in Southern California, for introducing me to um, this this other world. And um, the first book I think that a librarian put in my hands was Dealing with Dragons by Patricia C. Reed. Yeah. And it, it just like blue baby Lauren's mind. Um, I really haven't stopped reading since. Mm-hmm. Um, Nishida. Yeah, so I also grew up surrounded by books, thanks to my mom and dad, who, you know, to keep me occupied in my childhood, used to take me to bookstores. And, you know, I started reading whatever I could get my hands on. I My love of mystery started with the, any, the famous five novels. And I think even then I realized that books are such a great way to get insight into a different culture because they allowed a girl in Mumbai to experience, you know, the English countryside and a different culture sitting right in my home. So that's where my love of reading started. That's beautiful. Rita? Yeah, so Chinese was my first language. I I was born and raised in Taiwan. And um, so from a very young age, I was reading all of them. So my grandfather had this huge uh, library of martial arts novels, like Wuxia, Wuxia novels. Some of you might be like familiar with this. And so like, those were my earliest books, reading my grandfather's um, novels. And then after my family moved to the States, you know, and I mean, again, really shout out to libraries here. Um, my, my parents couldn't afford to buy me many books, but you know, I went to the local library and um, I just started like, that's how I, that's basically how I learned the language. I just read a bunch of books you know, um, like I remember being really into like the Goosebumps books uh, when I was like little and then like, you know, Babysitter's Club, you know, and then Sweet Valley High when I got a little bit older. And so um, I I was um, I, I always had my head in a book somewhere. Yeah, I same thing. I knew I was going to be a librarian someday, but yes, I knew I couldn't write. So I really do want to know, like, at what point, Nishida, did you know that you kind of wanted to be a writer? Um given all the reading that you had done? Yeah, at some point when I realized that, you know, English teachers were enjoying my essays more than the math teachers were enjoying my answers, I kind of figured that's where I was naturally leaning towards. But I didn't initially go into a career in writing because I went to my dad and I said, you know, I like writing, I want to get into journalism. But he, like most Indian parents, kind of cautioned me like, yeah, you can do that, but you want to get a stable job first. So (laughs) that's how I ended up in technology. But the love for writing remained. So as a passion project, you know, I would write short stories on the side. And then somehow that grew into writing full length novels. Mm -hmm. So so when was your first writing like so you wrote essays for school, but did you actually write anything for yourself at that point that you thought, oh, I'll publish this someday? The thought to publish didn't come to me till I was in college. And it happened when I read something that I didn't really enjoy. And that kind of gave me motivation. Like, oh, if this can get published, maybe I can too. (laughs) Kind of (laughs) funny. I can write better than that. I've heard that a lot. (laughs) And you actually did. How about you, Rita? When did you know you were going to be a writer and a published writer? I mean, I, you know, I've been writing, I've been uh, journaling since I was very young, but yeah, I think uh, like Nishida, I didn't really have a sense that you could be a writer Mm -hmm. as a career, you know, like my, my parents, like in my family, that wasn't a thing. Writing is something that you do as a hobby, maybe when you're retired, you know? So my first career was actually as a clinical psychologist. I um, went to school, got my PhD, and then worked for about 10 years in um, private practice before I kind of reached a point in my life where I decided that I was ready to take my write, my own writing more seriously. And so at that point, I went back to school to get my MFA. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, yeah, I, I think I, I, I started with short stories when I was in grad school um, and then eventually worked my way up to a novel. You know, the, so Deep as the Sky Dread Sea is the first um, fully novel that I've gotten published. Okay. I wanted to go back to something you said about um, when you were reading and you went to the library and that's how you learned English, um, which is much better than my relatives who all learn them from watching cartoons. So I'm impressed. <laughs> um, Lauren, how about you? When when did you know you were going to be a writer? I think my stories are very similar to what I'm hearing. I've always wanted to write, but it felt like like an unattainable dream, like being a pop star or like an actress or something like nobody, nobody can do that. 
Um, and I think I had a lot of imposter syndrome, like thinking I wasn't smart enough or talented enough and who would want to read what I have to say. Um, so it took me, yeah, it took a decade of teaching and talking about writing and reading with young people to realize that maybe, maybe I could do this. And um, the story from Medusa Sisters is I was on maternity leave with my daughter and um, I had just taught before I left a unit on Greek and Roman mythology, you know, like sixth grade curriculum. I think it's pretty like ubiquitous across the United States to do that in sixth grade. And I'm like up at 3 a.m. feeding her and I'm thinking, Medusa was a Gorgon, but who were the other Gorgons? Mm -hmm. And that was the idea. You know, I'm on Wikipedia, like on my phone over my baby's head. And I see this quote that says, the other Gorgons don't matter. They're appendages. Only Medusa matters. And it it changed my, the trajectory of my life. So, I mean, sure, we'll get into this later, but just asking and answering questions and continuing to be a curious person can lead you down these really incredible paths. Mm -hmm. Yes, that is just the thing that I hear is that, you know, um, having the confidence and then getting out and just doing it. Um, so I want to go read it. Um, I'd like to know, we, we sort of all talked about the things that might have been barriers to us, but because this is such a diverse panel, I would like to know if there were any specific things that were barriers for you in becoming published or getting to the point of being published? Yeah, I mean, I I do think the publishing industry, you know, it's I'm not going to claim that it's perfect, but I do think things have gotten better, you know, in the past kind of 10, 15 years since I started, you know, writing. Um, I do remember early on, um, I very much got the sense from some agents and editors that the only kind of story that they wanted to hear from an Asian American woman was kind of, you know, and I want to be clear here. I love Amy Tan. I love, I think the Joy Luck Club is kind of like a, it's an iconic novel, right? But they wanted stories about mothers and daughters having acculturation battles, you know, and, um, and that, that wasn't the kind of writing that I personally was interested in doing. And then, so I was getting a lot of, well, you know, we like your prose, but what if you gave us something about you know, like how Chinese culture differs from, you know, and um, so it took it took a number of years until I think I found the right people to read my book, you know, the the right agents, the right um, publishers. And uh, and and I feel very thankful that, you know, I was able to get this book published, even though it may not fit in with what some people expect from, mm -hmm. a, from an author who's like myself. Interesting. I'm going to go and come back to that after everybody speaks. I do have a question or follow up. Lauren? I think for me, it was just um, being a mother and trying to write at the same time. Um, I, I took a year off teaching because I was going to write this Medusa story that had come to me. And within a few months, I was pregnant with my, um, my third child and COVID hit Washington state. So I was just at home pregnant with two babies. Mm -hmm. Um, but I was so determined to write this book. And I think that's what I would want to say is that it is so possible. Like you can dig deep and find this like enormous boundless well of grit if you, if you want to. And what I ended up doing for almost all of Medusa's sisters was handwriting the book because I was with children all day long. <laughs> And then when they would go to sleep at night, I would type up what I wrote. So mm -hmm. Saba Tahir has this great quote where she's like, if I can do it, you can do it too. And I just want to like pay that forward because it really helped me keep going. Well, it's very much like Nora Roberts story, right? She was home in a snowstorm with three young children. You know, they were locked up for a week or something and she just started writing and look at her now, right? That, that could be you, Lauren. <laughs> Nishida, how about you? What kind of barriers or anything did you um, experience as you came through this process? Yeah, so I can really relate to what Lauren said, because when I sold my novel, my baby was three months old. So I was working through edits with my editor, who's wonderful and who was so flexible. But it was hard because, you know, I obviously I'm like taking care of a baby. So I had to wake up 
early morning before my baby got up try to try to get some writing done and i think in that process my main character who's a single mom she, i was able to capture her exhaustion better cuz that's how i felt most of the time mm-hmm. so that part was difficult and you definitely need to have a village to support you i'm able to be on this call right now because my husband is looking after my toddler mm-hmm. so you definitely need to have a support system of people who cheer you on and believe in you even when you don't believe in yourself that much mm-hmm. i find that really interesting and you know we, we can circle around this is that i once asked an author you know a sim- a very similar question like you know how do you get it all done in a day and she said would you ask a man that would you ask a male author that and i was just like oh yeah you know i don't know if i would and i don't know if you feel like um that it's a different scenario for you being a, 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 a female author trying to get a book out with the other um, demands on your time. And um, I'm going to go to Lauren for this because it's sort of a follow-up, but I still have another follow-up for Rita. <laughs> if, if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, you know, it was almost... Um... The laundry is never going away. The dishes are never going away. They're always going to be there. But what can change is your own outlook on it. And it was like a a paradigm shift for me. And I'm not sure I'm fully there yet. But realizing that if I don't get the laundry done or the dishes done or, you know, the perfect diorama with my eight-year-old tonight, but I do get the writing done, that's okay because the writing is fulfilling mom and like filling my bucket. And that really does I think make me a better, a better parent. And Ursula Le Guin is like one of my personal idols. And she writes a lot about that, about how being a mother actually like empowered her writing and made it and made it better. I also think Lauren, that there's a positive to having that because then your whole identity is not wrapped around being a writer. So you need to have, you know, because publishing is highs and lows, highs and lows, right? So you need to have people who are going to love you, even if you get a bad review or, you know, don't get selected for something. So having that life separate from writing, that kind of takes the pressure off, I feel sometimes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's a funny question for all of you guys too, is when you started referring to yourself as a writer because I think for years I was I would say like oh I'm Lauren I'm a former teacher or I'm Lauren I'm a mom of three and I really only think even in the past couple months I've started feeling comfortable saying I'm a writer me too (laughs) yeah I think it didn't happen I I didn't feel comfortable saying until the book had been published because I was I was always so afraid I mean you know going back to what I think Lauren you were saying about the imposter syndrome I was always so afraid somebody would like point at me and be like okay but you're not really right like there's nothing with your name on it so therefore you're not and I think that that's something that we all have to kind of come to like like no, we, we're writers because that's what we do. It's not because of what we publish necessarily. If you write, you're a writer. And if you keep going, you're a professional writer because it is a lot of, there's a lot of pushback. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I, and it actually uh, segues into what that follow-up as I had for Rita was that you had mentioned that you thought, <laughs> sorry, the publishing world is a little bit better right now, but it's not quite where it needs to be. But I, the question I have about that is, um, do you think that maybe a few years ago, diversity was sort of having a moment and that's, and do you think that that has continued or do you think that that has sort of fallen off with um, the climate right now? I mean, I think that honestly, that's probably a question that um, is better asked to somebody who's actually in the publishing industry, but I do think that readers are getting you know, savvier and, you know, like, I mean, I, I would personally like to think that it's not just like a fad, right? Like there was like a, like, oh, this is the fad period of where we publish a bunch of diverse writers. I I would like to think that's just because there are so many interesting stories out there that take place in so many, you know, areas of the world and readers are hungry, you know, for, for narratives that um, feel new and exciting to them. And so, um, um, my my personal sense is that the the industry is keeping up with the fact that readers are um, uh, you know more interested than ever before in these types of stories. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. Um, I'm going to go the other way, Nishida. What do you think about that? Yeah, I I do agree that things are better now, uh, but definitely at the end of the day, publishing is still a business, right? 
So I'm hoping that, you know, when these books come out, if people see that there's an audience for it, it's easier to make a business case than a moral case. So ultimately, you know, if we can prove that there are there's a large enough audience for our narratives, publishing has to catch on because they follow the money. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Lauren, what do you think about that? I think about it, especially as a former teacher, is like just allowing teachers the grace and the trust to pick books for their classrooms um, and their students that that engage students in different ways that offer opportunities for communion and compassion across cultures. Um, you know, especially when you see all the book bans and all of the the protests about what teachers and librarians are bringing to the to their students, it's so frustrating to me because these are these are the opportunities to explore our our cultural consciousness in like safe places with trusted adults who can navigate difficult conversations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so true. Um, and the kids are certainly missing out. Give you know they're the ones that are suffering out of this sort of like adult mania. Um, but going back to your, your actual books, because again, there's diversity there as well. Um, did you have to get an agent in order to get this book to a publisher? Because all of you are traditionally published. You're not self-published. So, um, Nishin, I want to start with you on this one. Did you, what was your agent story? Yeah, so I worked on this novel for many, many years, and my path to publishing, I knew that I wanted to get an agent first before trying to, you know, reach out to any publishing houses. So that's the route I was going to take. I worked on it for many years, trying to get, you know, I would get to the stage of having requests for full manuscripts, but then I would get rejections, but then they would have helpful suggestions. So I was pretty much revising my novel all the time. And then I got pregnant and then I had my baby. So I forgot about writing or publishing for a few months. And then one night I was up late at night with my baby and I happened to look at my phone and I saw that an agent offer was sitting in my inbox for a whole day, <laughs> which I couldn't see because I had had no time to check my phone. And that led to uh, other multiple offers. But I went with Lori Galvin, uh, who's my fabulous agent. And uh, awesome. yeah. Okay. So she, okay. So we'll talk about the getting what happens between agent and publisher in a second. So uh, what about you, Rita? What was your agent story? Um, so my, my, my agent quest kind of happened in two waves. So the first wave I was, this was back in my late twenties. Um, uh, I reached out to a few agents and that was when I heard the feedback like, oh, well, you're not really writing the kind of stuff that we're looking for. So I kind of gave up on it for a while and I decided to just focus my focus on other matters for for, for a bit. And then um, the second time um, I tried um, looking for agents was after I got my MFA. And um, at that point, um, I was very fortunate in that um, I I had gotten a couple of short stories published, um, and um, so a few agents reached out to me to to see if I was working on anything longer. Um, but I also participated. And there are some really great programs. I don't know if folks here are familiar with something called AWP, uh, the, the AWP conference. Yeah, like most of most writers probably are familiar with it. But like they have this program called the writer to agent thing where you submit. Um, a, a, a subsection of your manuscript and then um, basically a bunch of different agents from all a bunch of different uh, agencies read it and the ones that are interested will contact you so that's actually how I ended up meeting my current agent uh, Michelle Brower she's wonderful um, we, we met through the AWP writer to agent program so if folks are listening you know if, if you're looking for an agent yourself um, definitely do the query letter process but just be aware that there are these other programs that are also available and you um, you definitely want to give those a shot as well. Oh, I like that advice. Lauren? Oop, Lauren is... My... Yeah, Lauren, you're, you're frozen right now. I think you're back. <laughs> oh, oh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Is it okay? Oh, okay. So sorry. I can, I can move out of my son's room if I need to. Um, I got my agent, the traditional method, cold 
query letter, 10 pages, and it happened really quickly. Um, Jane Dysel is my agent. She's like a fairy godmother. But I want to preface this because it's such an easy, straightforward story that I wrote another book first, um, like five, six, seven years ago around there, I had written a YA book and it got approximately like 4 billion rejections. So um, I think a lot of writers have that book in the drawer, you know, that that was their first try that just didn't didn't make it and this was like my like my moonshot you know like I'm gonna try one more time Mm -hmm. um and it worked so keep going like I was saying just you just like don't give up Mm -hmm. well what is your uh, any of you uh, your advice on staying away from bad agents how do you know somebody um anyone who asks for money yes you should never you should never pay an agent never anything like that not for you know helping you revise your manuscript not for anything and the other thing I would also say is look you know look up your favorite writers and then see who their agents are because if they represent your favorite writers chances are they're legit so um you know look go go to that acknowledgement section in the back of the book and be like all right who who's this author thank you um and uh, like any good agent will never pressure you to sign with them so if you tell an agent, you know, I need a two week time period to contact other folks and they're kind of pushing you to make a decision right away, they're probably not the right fit. Any good agent will want you to wait, you know, because they'll be confident that you'll come back to them. Right. And you want to you want this business partnership to be fruitful and long. So anyone who's kind of pushing you, making you uncomfortable at the start is probably not a good fit. Okay. You can also ask for references. And, you know, I think most agents would give you a couple emails or a couple phone numbers to reach out and talk to people and see what their process was like. Um, I'm sure that's that can be really helpful as well. Mm -hmm. Do you recommend um, interviewing a couple of three agents? Is that even a thing? I mean, certainly you want to you want to be able to have at least a phone conversation with um, a couple of agents just to make sure that it because sometimes, you know, an agent could be perfectly legitimate, but they have a completely different vision for your book than what you have. You, you know what I mean? Like and, and ultimately, you don't want to go with somebody who's going to be like, I want you to fundamentally change everything that you're trying to do with mm-hmm. this with this novel. And so, yeah, talk to talk to agents and figure out who is more most aligned with you in terms of your not just your vision for the book, but your your career hopes. Mm, good point. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go to some um, audience questions because we have a few. Um, most people are interested in what was the what was the process between agent to publishing? What did they do to get you in the limelight? Um, I'm gonna start with Nishita for this one. Yeah. So. Uh, My agent kind of gave me an idea of what kind of edits would be needed for the novel before I signed with her. We kind of had like a very high level discussion on that. And she has an editorial background. So I was lucky there. So after I signed with her, we spent, I think, a month or so kind of going through some light edits, trying to fix some plot holes because there are always plot holes. And she had a submission list, uh, you know, ready and she knew what kind of editors would be interested in the book. So we took it to submission and we were able to get an offer, like, which I know is not the norm. It's totally okay for a novel to be on submission for more than even six months. I've heard stories of people getting an offer even more than that. In our case, we were fortunate. We were able to get an offer within like a, a month. Wow. Okay. Wow. <laughs> um, Rita. Yeah, I mean, I think um, my my story is pretty similar to Nishida's. I my my agent is, um, you know, ma- we had an initial conversation where she was like, "These are the changes that I think would need to happen to your novel." And the good news is that she and I were pretty much in accord about what kind of changes needed to be made. And then so we went through. Um, I would say we spent about six to eight months just revising and sending each other drafts back and forth until we got to a point where she felt like it was ready to actually go out to publishers. And then from that point forward, we sent it out to publishers. Um, I was um, also pretty fortunate in that I heard back from publishers um, pretty quickly. And then so, uh, and, and then, you know, we, I spoke with a few different 
editors at different publishers and then um, we ended up going with the one who um, we felt like was the best fit for my book. Okay, and Lauren? Yeah, very similar to Rita um, and um, Nishida as well. Um, it went pretty quickly and there were a couple offers and then you kind of, you know, decide just like when you're picking your agent, do our goals align? Are we on the same page? You do the same thing with um, your editor as well, because if anything, you work with your editor um, much longer throughout this process of getting the book ready for publication than you do with your agent. And my agent was so good because I have zero business acumen. Like I would have sold my book for $10. I was just so excited that someone liked it. So it is good to have someone who really knows the business um, and understands all of the business and legal jargon. Mm -hmm. um, and so, again, I mentioned that you all are traditionally published. So I, I'd be curious about if you had not gotten a deal with a publisher, would you have self-published? And what for you, what would be the pro and con of self-publishing versus traditional publishing. And Rita, I think I'm starting with you on this. I think that self-publishing definitely works for some people. Like, I think if you are a good self-promoter, absolutely self-publishing can be a good option. Um, if you are like me, however, and you know, you like, I, 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 I don't know the first thing about how to mark, you know, market or promote myself. I, I don't know how to get PR. I don't know how to get publicity, any of those things. So um, for me, I, I wouldn't really have considered self-publishing because I know that it would have just ended up with, you know, like technically it's published, but like no one ever bought a copy because I didn't know how to advertise and I didn't know mm -hmm. how to drum up um, buzz for the book. Um, how, you know, but that said, like there are some people like I, Tell me if I'm misremembering, but like um, Olivia Blake, the author of um, The Atlas Six, like didn't that book start out as a self-published book? Am I making this up? Maybe somebody has an answer to this. And that book did so well that Tor ended up picking up the book. Mm -hmm. Like, I think they gave her like a major deal for that book. So the, the point is there are people who are really good at the business side of things. And if you are good at the business side of things, um, self-publishing, I think can definitely work for you. Mm -hmm. Lauren? Yeah, I 100% agree with that. I think I want to say Colleen Hoover self-published Verity. Okay. Yes. Um, and then it got picked up later. Um, and obviously that did very well for, for Colleen Hoover. Um, I would also add, I wouldn't have had the confidence without having some kind of editorial process as well, though. I wouldn't, I, before I self-published, I would need a lot of trusted readers or beta readers or um, writing circle friends to kind of look through it before I would have put it out there. Mm -hmm. There's so many things you don't catch no matter how many times you read it, you know, from the smallest continuity errors to just sometimes those big plot holes that you just, you assumed everyone understood and no, it's just a ga big gaping like abyss in your story. <laughs> Helpful. Nishida, um, would you have self-published if um, you hadn't gotten a publisher? And this is for me? Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah uh, like I agree with the others. Self-publishing is definitely a path that can work for some, but we have to understand it's not as simple as clicking a button on Amazon and having your book be out there. There's a lot of work and I have now even more admiration for the amount of works having, you know, that it takes to get a book in front of readers in such a crowded marketplace that I don't think I would have been able to do it all by myself. So for me, uh, traditional publishing is the only path that would have worked. I would not have gone the self-publishing route because you just have to manage too many aspects of the book. And yeah, and if you go into self-publishing, there are some people who might hold it against you if you then try to go back into traditional publishing, which is not fair, but it happens. Wow. Um, yes, I've heard that too. Um I'm going to go back to an early question from Jean, who asks, um, she also is one, has always wanted to be writing and is 50 year old, seven year old mom. Her son went to just went to college and she has a full time job. What do you do to keep yourself writing? And I know, Lauren, you had mentioned this a little while ago, and Nishida, you had also talked about the pros and cons of having <laughs> both sides. But what is it that keeps you writing every day or when you write? 
And I think I'm starting with um, with Lauren with this one. Um, I have, I set goals every month on the first of the month for um, um, word counts that I want to get to. And that kind of keeps me honest with myself. But I also, I, do, I don't prescribe to the you have to write every day model. Um, I know that works for some people, but for me, it's like, I, if I have a really, really good writing Wednesday, I might not write anything on Thursday or Friday. Like it does really ebb and flow, um, mm -hmm. for me. So I do know though, that if I'm having that really awesome Wednesday, I'm going to get as much done as possible. Forget the laundry, forget dinner. We're ordering pizza because like mom's on a roll, like embrace when you're feeling it. I love that. Nishida? Yeah, I, I have to agree with Lauren here. Um, you have to give yourself grace. There are periods when, you know, you can't get to it at all. And that's okay because there's life happens, right? So many things come into your life and they could distract you from writing. But if you're truly into this, you will always come back to it. Because for me personally, writing is like this itch that, you know, I'm itching to tell this story, to learn more about this character. So you'll come back to it. Even. So don't beat yourself up if there are breaks in between. That is really nice, giving yourself some grace. Rita. Um, so definitely giving yourself like don't don't writing should be fundamentally fun, right? Like if you if it ends up feeling like an unbearable chore, then kind of what's the point? Like, you know, we have unbearable chores that we need to do in real life. We don't need to add another one to the to the pile. Um, but I, I also think for me it was really important I, I I started writing a couple of novels and then ended up giving up on them because I just wasn't interested enough. I wasn't fascinated enough with the topic. And so like ultimately finding a topic that I was just really, you know, intrigued by was like my natural, my curiosity kind of naturally pulled me through to the end. You know, I mean, it sounds a little bit like Lauren, what you were saying about like, yeah, like what about the other Gordon sisters? We never hear about them, right? And so like having that um, that that interest will help to um, get you to the finishing point. Okay, I'm gonna go back for a question from Kurt about agents. Are there differences between fiction and nonfiction editors or agents? Um, anybody can answer this one because you all write fiction. So have you noticed that there's any differences um, if you were to have written a nonfiction book? I, I think even the querying process can be different, right? If you're submitting fiction or nonfiction. Um, I'm not sure if it's like a 10 page sample that you submit or it's more of a proposal. I do think depending on if it's, you know, creative nonfiction or, um, you know, uh, uh, really, really serious academic text. Um, yeah, I think that you would look for different agents, definitely. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, you might be right, Lauren, for nonfiction. In some cases, you might just have to write a proposal, not have an entire book written before you can try to get an agent or even an editor. And also for nonfiction, it would help if you have if you can prove that you are an authority on the subject. So that might be a case in which having a large social media following or, you know, have proving yourself that you are a proper influencer in that particular space that might help your chances. But that is not at all required for writing fiction. You do not need to be, you know, a pro at Twitter or anything to get your fiction book published. Okay. Um, Duncan had emailed me this question earlier. I made some public exercises of writing and posting online. It's my understanding that publishers do not want to see previously published works. For instance, in this case on Facebook, if you want to publish an original novel, can you comment on this? I'm not sure about the Facebook part, but like, um, if it's already been published, would a new publisher pick up your book? I mean, I think there's rights and stuff associated with it, right? Yeah, I think in most cases they would not if it's already been published, but unless it like blows up or something and then publishers come to you. Oh, All maybe that. that's what he was talking about with Facebook, if it was to blow up on like Facebook or Book Talk or something like that. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Um, Anne Marie asked this really interesting question. Did you copyright or trademark any of your work while it was in draft form? What was that process like if you had to? Um, I think I'm starting with Nishida on this one. 
No, because I wasn't even sure if this was ever going to see the light of day. So it I didn't even think along those lines. It was just draft revised version 110, please work. <laughs> so I don't think, yeah, I don't think it comes into play that early in the process. So at least for me, I didn't do any of it. Okay. So I'm seeing everybody going, nope, nope. Okay. Um, did any of your books get book talked? <laughs> I love I book talk, cool. but so, um, yeah, nothing, nothing that's gone like super viral. But if anyone wants to take a shot, any of the attendees, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, it, something you, you said, Nishita, earlier, and in, in this in a question as well about social media is that did you all feel like your publishers did enough to really support the um, debut of your book, the launch of your book, so that people knew about it. There was buzz about it. And um, Rita, I think I'm starting with you. Sorry, the, what, the question is about, um, do you th feel like your publisher did a good enough job of uh, launching your book, making sure it was visible and there was buzz about it? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was, um, I was very lucky in that my publisher really supported the book, you know, and I, I do know that if you talk to different authors, you kind of get different stories. So I, I, I don't think I necessarily speak for everyone who's ever published a book here, but um, my, my publishing team was great. They, um, I, I think they had a lot of faith in the book and um, I, I really couldn't have asked um, for them to, to do a better, you know, to do a better job mm -hmm. trying to build us for the book than they did. Nice. That's good to hear. Lauren? Yeah, likewise. If anything, I just felt like um, I, I was so grateful for all of it that I wanted to deliver. You know, I was just so hopeful, like they put all this love and support into my book. Um, there's a lot of pressure then when it goes out into the world that people are going to like it or um, finish it or review it or talk about it or recommend it to their friends. Um so yeah, that can be hard to temper in your within yourself is the is monitoring and and feeling okay with expectations. Mm -hmm. Nishida? Yeah, I'm also very lucky in that I've had a great experience with my publisher. They were so good working with me and my publicist helped me set up a launch event at a local bookstore. And there was a winter storm going on in Houston at the time. So we were in touch constantly, like emailing each other every hour. Is it on? Is the event still on? You know, but it really helped. Uh, they helped me take off the stress off of publishing. And I was so happy to see the book in so many libraries. Last time I checked, my book is in more than 300 plus libraries. And I know that I owe my publishing team a lot for that result so there you have we have all three of yours <laughs> yes. okay. of course we do um okay so we've asked lots of questions about agents and publishing which i think we could just talk about all night people continue to have questions but i want to talk a little bit about your books because we have about 15 more minutes so first question um did you come up with the title of your book or did somebody else and i think i'm starting with lauren I did. I mean, it was like, I, I was joking earlier that it's super straightforward because it's, you know, when you're reading a book and you get to the moment where the title shows up and it's like your Eureka moment, like, oh, that's why it's called this. I, I Mine doesn't really have that. It is about Medusa's sisters. Um, but it's also a little tongue in cheek because they are just known as Medusa's sisters, right? Nobody knows what their names are. Um, the other two Gorgons, um, and which was also about, you know, we could talk about more about this too, is like designing the cover and all of the, you know, aesthetic processes that go into a book. But I was very adamant that Medusa would not, would not be on the cover. Mm -hmm. So she is, when you zoom in on the book, you can see her in the background, mm -hmm. kind of the shadow behind them. It's actually a beautiful cover if you get a chance to see it or oh, read it. You will read it. You want to read it as soon as you see it. <laughs> Nishida? Um. Nishida, what, what was, um, how, did you come up with your title? No, I had a different working title. And at that point, I didn't really think too much about the title because I was like, that's the least important part. I was like, if a publisher agrees to publish it, they can name it whatever they want as long as they agree to put it out there in the world. But my agent had to come up with this wonderful title that I'm so happy with. Excellent. I mean, it it's funny because there's some authors that are just like, it has to be this, it has to be, but maybe you get to the Stephen King 
place. And that's when you can say things like that. <laughs> How about you, Rita? Did you pick your title? I did. And can I be perfectly honest? I don't know if I'm allowed to say this. I kind of regret it a little bit because, there, because after after the book came out, I was like, oh, that title is a mouthful. And like very often when people say it, they like end up saying it backwards, which is fine. Like I totally get it. Um, but um, I think maybe if I had to have the chance to redo it, I would like lop it in half and just take the second half. But um, but the, the yeah, I my 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 editor was very kind she said that she actually really liked the title and that's why we ended up going with the the version that we ended up going with i love it um nashita i'm going to start with you about this on um what um are you a plotter or a pantser when you were writing this book did you have it all plotted out or did you just write so i do have a high level outline i need to know i'm writing a murder mystery so i need to know the who when where how I had those things plotted out. And then as you go along, you maybe discover that some character should have a major role instead of a minor role. So you go through that in the rewrites. But I always, always work with a high level outline. I have a lot of admiration for people out there who can go 60,000 words into something without knowing where the story is going. I'm not one of those people. <laughs> Everybody's different. You got to do what works for you. Rita, how about you? Um. I, I also, I mean, I, I wouldn't say it an outline, but I have this little cork board where like basically I, the major plot um, points I write out on um, index cards and then I kind of like tack them up on the cork board in the order in which the plot points are going to happen. So those are kind of uh, pre-established, but then everything in between the major plot points, like I, I like to allow myself a little bit of spontaneity so that I don't feel like I'm, you know, following an algorithm. So um as long as I get to the next plot point, it's fine. So that's kind of how I did it. Okay, wow. Um, Lauren? I'm a plotter as well. And for um, writing this kind of fantasy, a lot of research goes into it. So I think I had to have an outline. So it kind of organized where I would go research wise. Um, and that that was really helpful. But I, I think you have to be flexible. You know, it's um, your outline is like a suggestion of where the story should go, but it can organically, you know, curve and dip. And sometimes you need to go with it. And sometimes new characters will show up 200 pages in that you hadn't even known existed. And it's just one of the like really fun surprises, like the magic and the mystery of this kind of career. Mm hmm. Um, did any of you have to submit a, a an out your outline to your publisher before they would take you on? I think for my age, I had to send a synopsis. Okay. And those are so hard to write. Like that was harder to write than the book is, you know, the one page wrap up. Okay. I didn't know if the, um, they were more stringent with debut authors versus somebody who's already established. So with your next books, I'll ask you, did you still have to send a synopsis? <laughs> did you, Rita? Did you, Nishida? I mean, um, I... So, Nishida, why don't you go? No, go ahead, go ahead. I, I mean, for my understanding, and again, please correct me if I'm wrong, is that for most debut authors, usually they don't accept things on spec because they don't know that you're going to deliver. Do, you know, So, mm -hmm. like, usually you have to have a... Um, a novel draft completed before you submit it to the publisher with agents you might be able to get away with a you know like if they you know like your other work they might be like oh we'll sign you up based on the synopsis for your novel but um i do yeah like i have heard of um like i have a friend who whose um third book second novel is coming out in a couple of months and she sold her um, second novel on spec so the idea is that she just had to give her agent a good synopsis and then they gave her the deal based on that so I do think that happens but usually my understanding is usually not for debut authors same was yeah I agree with Rita for any querying writers out there we need to have a completely full length novel before we start to query agents because they expect you to have that, especially for debut. Even if your idea is really good, they need to see that the execution is there. So even a partial draft would not work. So we cannot just write, you know, like 50 pages and try to see if that works because they get to the end of the 50 pages and they want to know what's next, right? So it's always better to have a complete novel before you start reaching out to agents. And of course, I've heard that too, that once you 
get yourself published, then for the subsequent novels, you would have to write something called a proposal, which would depend on the terms outlined in your contract. It could be like 50 pages and a synopsis or some sample pages that depend, that varies. Mm. It does sound like things are different for different agents too. So um, that is actually kind of hopeful because different people function differently. Um, so what is your favorite part of writing and particularly this book? Rita, I'm going to, um, I think, start with you. Was it the plot, the characters, the setting, the world building? What was it that really like engaged you or got you started on, on getting this book on paper? Um, I think it just allowed me to tap into like my innermost geek, you know, like I'm a I'm a giant history geek. I'm a giant research. Like I'm, I I did a tremendous amount of research on pirates, like more than you would expect from like, like if you looked at my search history, you'd be like, oh, an eight year old child who's super into pirates has been on this computer. But it was like an adult who was like spending all of her time, like reading books about pirates. Um, and so I it, I mean, I think it gave me an excuse to. Um, look into an era of history and look into a historical figure that um, I would have looked up for free. Do you know what I mean? Like I would have done that research for free. And the fact it's it's like a bonus that I was able to get a novel out mm -hmm. of it. So for you, it was the research, the deep dive into the pirate and the history of the piracy. And oh my gosh, that's interesting. Um, I'm gonna go when I get to know you, Nishida. I'm sure your uh, browser history is very interesting. <laughs> Because you wrote a murder mystery. But Lauren, how about you? <laughs> I, mean, my, I wouldn't say my browser history is that much better. I mean, like looking up, you know, ancient Greek brothels and like all <laughs> kinds of poisons, you know, I, I look like a total weirdo um, according to my search history. Um, I love character. That's my favorite. Um, and for Medusa's sisters, when I was trying to map out who Steno and Uriley were going to be, the very first thing I did was design their snakes because mm -hmm. I didn't want them to have that iconic like Versace green snake screaming um, female face. I wanted them to look different. And so I did a lot of research on snakes. I looked at a lot of pictures of snakes online. And once I chose these different snakes for their heads, their, their personalities almost organically grew from there. Um, so that was my favorite part. As much as I love your book, I would not do that. <laughs> okay, Nishida, tell us about your browser history. <laughs> is it as bad or as complex? <laughs> yeah, so I make sure when I Google, I'll put it at the end, researching for a novel so that people <laughs> can keep that <laughs> in their history. Um, but for me, the best part about writing this particular book was to be able to write about South Asian culture and immigrant life, like all that stuff came the easiest because it was just pouring out of me. It was basically write what you know, and that's the life I've known. So it was really fun exploring those elements, especially to have that in a thriller mystery genre because we don't get that often. So that was fun. And I really enjoyed writing the character of Grandma who's this oldest person in the house and she has no filters between her mouth and her brain. So she pretty much says what she wants and it was really fun writing her dialogues. Mm -hmm. I love that because my grandmother also has no filter. <laughs> I think, you know, a lot of grandmas don't. Um, I love it. So, it, so to me, it sounds like almost all of your books are um, uh oriented around people, families, found families, things like that. Like I, I, I would imagine that your pirate group is, 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 you know, your pirate person's family as, as, as it was. So um, was that a conscious decision to really dig into relationships um, in your books, um, Nishida? In your book? it, it wasn't a conscious decision. But when I was trying to come up with conflicts, it just automatically came out that, you know, you would have sibling conflicts and you know, sisters. I, actually, I have two sisters in the book, but interestingly, they were friends first in earlier drafts. But the feedback I got was that this relationship is too toxic for them to be friends in real life. Like people were commenting, there is no way this person is going to be friends with this so I found a way to force them to be around each other, even if they don't like each other very much. And that's how I ended up making them sisters. So that's how all the story came about. <laughs> I love that. I love it. Yeah, Rita? 
I, I mean, I, I think that if you spend all your time on a ship with the same people, you know, 11 months out of the year, you kind of have to become found family. You know, and, and, and again, as with family, there are going to be times when you drive each other, you know, insane. And there are going to be times when you're so thankful that the other person is exists and is in your corner. And so I, I actually think it would be strange if I wrote a version of the novel in which the relationships didn't take center stage. Mm -hmm. um, given the, the the way that these people lived. Right, right. And, and I think as a reader, you want that because, you know, you want to see your, own, you know, how to figure out your own relationships through the fiction of your relation, you know, the what you wrote. Um, Lauren, how about you? Yeah, going off what you were just saying about seeing relationships that either parallel or speak to you. I mean, I think that reading is, you know, this opportunity for catharsis, you know, and you can kind of work through some of your own um, emotional baggage or history when you read or feel connected to somebody. Um, I don't have a sister, like a biological sister. Um, and I wrote a book about sisters, but that's because my, um, my girlfriends are like my most sacred relationship. I love my husband and my children, but I mean, my, I, my girlfriends are so important to me. Um, and that's a testament to them. Um, also, I think, you know, if you're a writer, you're an observer. So you're, you're constantly watching dynamics and, and watching the way people interact with each other. And you want to write to that authentically in your stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one thing I found about all of your stories is that the characters are so relatable in some way to what, you know, what my life is or what I think other people's lives are. It's, they're just wonderful. And I hope everybody gets to read them. Um, we're just about out of time. And I do want to ask before we go, um, Rita, what is what is uh, up for you for next? What next? You Your book came out last May. So we're kind of like have high expectations for something soon. <laughs> um, uh, don't because I'm a very slow writer. I, I actually I wish I were a much faster writer than I am. But I have started work on the second novel. And um, it's it's um, it actually takes place in the near future. So it's a speculative novel that takes place um, a little bit in the future instead of a historical novel. So um, it's interesting to try to tackle something different from what I've done before. Wow, that's like totally different, you know, when from historical <laughs> fiction to sci-fi almost. Yeah, but, you know, like I think I, there are certain themes I'm obsessed with as a writer. And so you're, you'll, you'll see the same themes probably repeated in this that's one good. as well. Excellent. I'll look forward to it. Lauren? I actually turned in the revision for my second book today. So I'm operating on like four hours of sleep and like an unhealthy amount of coffee. So, uh, but it's called Mother of Rome and it's not Greece. We're in ancient Rome. And it's the story of Rhea Silvia, who's the mother of Romulus and Remus. Ooh, catnip. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> when does that come out? Or do you think it'll come out? I think end of the year, but um, it's still up in the air. Okay, that's on to totally on my TBR pile now. Nishida, what about you? Your book just came out, so no pressure. <laughs> yeah, so I'm still in the thick of, you know, getting the word out about this book. So it's too early to talk about what's next. But I'm just enjoying this part of the publishing phase, you know, getting to talk to uh, readers at local events, you know, signing my very first book, all that, just enjoying those special moments, soaking it all in before I start drafting again. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone on the call, you know, please uh, ask your local libraries to order all our books. We love libraries. I love to see my books in all the libraries. So thank you. Support your libraries. Thank you. That is a perfect way to end today's conversation. Support your libraries, support your authors. Um, these books are fantastic and you would never, ever know that you were debut authors because they're just so wonderfully written and so thoughtful and insightful and funny and relatable. So um, thank you all for being here with us tonight and sharing your insights. And thank you everybody who joined us for the evening. And I hope you enjoyed it just as much as I did. Good night, everybody. Oops, let me get this.